Okay. Uh, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we might have another one or two uh, wander in, but um, I want to introduce uh, Grant Fullen. He's from WISE. He's uh, uh, a, a ham radio enthusiast, amateur radio enthusiast. And when I was looking for somebody to teach this uh, session, I, I contacted a buddy of mine who's, uh, who works in hazmat. And I said, can you, can you recommend an amateur radio operator who might be able to cover the basics with us? And he, he didn't hesitate. He said that uh, you might want to contact Grant Fullen. So, uh, so Grant, I appreciate you joining us tonight. And uh, I know ham radio is something that I've been fascinated with and I've uh, entertained the thought of, of pursuing my, my license and learning a little more about it. But, uh, but maybe this will kind of push me over the edge and, uh, and uh, kind of encourage some of us in that direction. So Grant, I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, thanks, Philip. Uh, as Philip said, my name is Grant Fullen. Uh, I'm an amateur radio enthusiast. Um, he's asked me to put together a few little information here for tonight. I put together just a little uh, PowerPoint pre presentation, hopefully to maybe cover a few points and you can learn a little bit more uh, about what it takes and what you need and a little bit about ham radio. Okay, I guess I'll start off, what is ham radio? Well, years ago, it started off with a simple spark gap device, uh, maybe like, um, you know, uh, operators uh, sending telegraphs, maybe you could think of that a little, you know, and it was Morse code. And that's kind of the beginnings of it. Uh, th that particular mode, it was pretty messy. And as it was amateur radio, but as time went on, the reason why we have the name ham uh, or hams, it was actually a derogatory remark. What it was, uh, you know, guys in the city would be trying to, you know, do a little communication between each other. Well, they didn't realize it, but because that spark gap, as messy as it was, and uh, it would actually interfere with the uh, with, you know, radio stations and TV stations or whatever it may be at the time anyway. So, you know, them guys would contact them guys and they would call them hams, meaning it a bad thing. So hams just like, okay, we're hams. You know, we adopted it, we, you know, we loved it. But it's it's amateur radio or ham radio. That's where they got the name ham radio. And, you know, it's, it's a real good thing. It, there's a lot of uh, electronics involved, uh, a lot of communication, uh, local, of course, when I usually say local, I don't mean like in your town, that's more around the United States, but you'll learn a little bit more about uh, two meter, 440. That's, you know, it is really local in your town. And if you're doing simplex or duplex, you know, HF high frequency operation, you know, it's, you know, you sit here and talk to people in Texas or wherever, like I'm in Virginia here. And, and that's what, you know, we consider that more local. Uh, it's quite, quite easy to uh, take your rig that does 100 watts and depending on what time of day it is and what frequency you're on, I mean, it's quite easy to talk, you know, down in South America and <clears throat> over in Europe. And uh, I've worked, gosh, you could look at my log online. Uh, I've worked a lot of countries around the world. I'd like to do a little bit more work in, uh, in China. I ain't done a whole lot of work in China. But anyway, besides that, I'm, uh, let me see where I'm at. Let me pay attention here. Yeah, so yeah, it, it's fun and it's educational and you meet a lot of cool people. And uh, that's a little bit about what is ham radio and the modes on it. Uh, I'll, go in, I'll go into that just a little bit more. Hold on, let me go to the next slide here. Yeah, types of conversations. Uh, once you make your technician's license, you'll get on two meter or 440 repeaters doing duplex and you can learn how to do simplex point to point. And the types of things is they just call it, you know, a rag shoe. That's kind of what I'm doing with you right here. We're just sitting here, see if you guys are not talking back, but sitting here talking about whatever, whoever. Uh, there's contests that go on. Those, those are the types of things that go on and that's a little bit different. Uh, there's all kinds of different contests uh, around the world to promote, you know, ham radio and getting out and making contacts around the world and stuff. Um, you'll, when you start getting on the uh, HF high frequency, uh, you'll start tuning in and tuning around and listening. You'll see that there's, uh, you know, formal nets. You know, it may be a net, the friendly bunch net, uh, you know, every Thursday night at 9 p.m., you know, you'll log in. And example, my, my call is November Foxtrot 1 Juliet. So when they say, uh, you know, looking for check-ins, and I, I may give my call, you know, November Fox 1 Juliet, and they'll note me down and, and they maybe have a particular topic. That's kind of formal nets type thing. There's the informal nets where they'll just have, you know, and they'll get together every, you know, you and your friends or whoever may want to have a net at some frequency at a certain time and talk about whatever. Uh, really good folks in ham radio like anywhere else. You'll find everything from uh, people, uh, to church groups, to T 
technicians uh, repairing stuff. I mean, it, it's just like it is anywhere else. A lot of good things like that. <clears throat> you can set up your ham radio stations anywhere, and I mean anywhere, from little hand talkies, uh, just like a little walkie-talkie you would think of, to uh, portable HF stations, take you some wire, throw it up in a tree or whatever, or, or some little uh, easy, easy portable setups. I mean, you can sit there and you can start doing uh, a lot of work. They have a lot of good, uh, like, parks on the air. That's people set up in parks, and they'll have little, it's not a contest, but it's just a recreational thing, you know, uh, mountains on the air, you know, stuff like that. Islands on the air, you'll contact a bunch of different islands, and you know, uh, things like that. Anyway, there, there's lots of different ways to do uh, portable work in ham radio, and a lot of different your equipment, I mean, you can get into it and buy used equipment, which is probably what I would recommend to you. Uh, not your little new, your two meter stuff. I mean, you can buy a little, a Bofang, uh, little transceiver, a little hand talkie for, I don't know, somewhere around 30, 35 bucks shipped to you. If you make your technician license, you know, that's a great, a great place to start. But besides that, you can, once you start getting into HF equipment, it's like anything else. It's like home stereos and like TVs. I mean, you can get a lower price points to, I mean, tens of thousands of dollars in <clears throat> in equipment and antennas or whatever. So I mean, there's it's, it's there's something for everybody for, for your budget. You can get into it. It's it's nothing out of your reach. Um, here's an example. The next screen. This is an example of a, a couple of transceivers. A gentleman's home station there. You'll see he's got a computer screen. He'll have uh, he's watching a spot network. He's logging all of his contacts, and you'll log stuff either if you're working contacts. Or if just if we're talking to each other, uh, you'll you'll give your call and you'll write down a log. Uh, everybody uses, well, I won't say everybody, but a lot of people use electronics, QRZ, a couple of different places for your log books online like it. But you can keep a paper log if you wish. I mean, it's you know you can do it either way you like like that. But that's just an example there of um, you know a little station uh, set up so you can do some work. Lots of different modes and uh, stuff you can do. I'll talk about a little bit about that more in a minute. Let's see, female operators. There's a lot more female operators now than there used to be. I hear a lot more uh, females on the air. Uh, you know, they get, everybody gets in ham radio for different, you know, different reasons. Uh, like me, I'm, uh, I'm into more electronics and stuff. You know, uh, I'll do diagnostic board level repair, working on equipment. So uh, that, that part for me, like building antennas and stuff like that, basic stuff like that you can do. There's, there's kind of something for everybody, even if you just want to, you know, get a system set up and uh, you know, just operate and talk to people and, and have fun meeting people and, and talking about different things. That's something to do. But yeah, I do see a lot of a, a lot more female operators. I encourage everybody, you know, to try to to try to learn a little bit about ham radio and get into it. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen Last Man Standing, but uh, Tim Allen, he, he you know, he's a ham radio operator in that show. Uh, I've actually worked some of those uh, guys that uh, actually working with the show before, uh, they'll have a little thing and, and they'll send out a little email. And Anyway, I've, I've worked some of those guys, but anyway, it's uh, I'm glad to see that someone put in, in something like that and more, you know, in Hollywood and, and TV shows and places like that. It's a, a pretty good light on ham radio and there's a lot of things you can use it for. We was discussing earlier before we come in, before everybody else got here about uh, example of people doing these runs across the mountain or, or cycling events and uh, setting up uh, check-in stations because sometimes cell signal you know it's not it's not good it's not got really good coverage around the mountains here and you can set up you know like ham radio operators we can get in there and and help you know just talk back and forth and make sure everyone's safe things like that and uh, who's a typical ham and you'd be surprised i mean people i mean like me i work in the body shop i'm a body and frame technician that's what i do for a living uh, but, you know, I'm a ham radio operator. Uh, there's all different. I mean, uh, I was trying to think of the youngest ham. Oh, I'd hate to tell you wrong. I don't know if it was, if he was 11, 12. Or, anyway, I mean, there's, there's kids all up to, you know, hams that's been around, you know, for a while. Uh, you know, and I encourage everybody to get out and learn a little bit about it. Let's see here. Why do you need a license? It's the Federal Communication Commission. <laughs> it's uh, once you learn a little bit, study a little bit, and 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 get some help and learn some a few things. It's um, you they give you a call sign like um, I don't know in Bristol a local channel I watch is WCYB Channel Five. Uh, so you know they're they're a commercial station. Uh, 
we're considered amateur operators, but we still have to be licensed just like they do to the FCC. Ours is governed a little bit different in part 97, uh, but we still have to have a call sign like, you know, mine's November Foxtrot 1 Juliet and F1J. So when I, you know, if I'm talking to someone every 10 minutes, of course you'll learn I'm not going to get into a lot of that. You know, every 10 minutes I have to identify this is NF1J with, you know, NF1 uh, B or whoever it may be, uh, you have to identify yourself. Uh, a handy thing to know is if you're a ham radio operator around the world, you at least have to know enough English to uh, give your call sign. So I've, I've made a lot of good contacts around the world, but I could hardly, you know, not hardly understand anything but enough to get their call sign. And so an official contact is if I say November Fox 1 Juliet, you give your example call sign back to be, you know, November Fox 1 uh, Bravo. And as long as we understood each other, then I can log that in a log. That's a contact. You know, if you can't understand a full call, then, you know, you can't log it. But that's what, you know, context is, uh, you know. But anyway, the FCC, uh, before I get too much off topic there, you have to uh, take a test. Test is $15. I'm actually a volunteer examiner, but uh, I'm uh, licensed through ARRL to do that, to actually get together with a team of hams uh, and administer tests to, to folks. And, um, and after this is uh, done, if anyone ever has any questions or stuff, I'll try to put my email up here and y'all can contact me. And we do go to places like, um, we go to the library in different places, uh, Big Stone, Wise, Round. Uh, we do try to, you know, help everyone as much as we can. And this is all volunteer basis for us. So, you know, we just, we try to work with everybody the best as we can. But anyway, yeah, you need to, you need to get a uh, license through the FCC uh, because without it, you can't get on air. And if you do, there's actually big tens of thousand dollar fines for people that do things like that. Not very good. That's just where it starts out at. Let me get a little drink of water here. All right, let me go to the next one. Yeah, what are some other ways uh, ham radio and hams communicate? Well, there's a bunch of different ways. The, what I was telling you earlier about the different modes, you know, Morse, Morse code, CW, that's constant wave, uh, or continuous wave, rather. And that's, you know, if you work in code, if you want to learn how to work that, you can still work it. There is a lot of hams, a lot of hams just doing CW. And if you have a frequency, I'll give you an example, 20 meters, uh, 14 megahertz, around 14.75 megahertz, uh, you'll get in uh, Ridi and, and Morse code through there. You'll learn, you'll learn all about that uh, the more you study that. But anyway, uh, Morse code, phone, that's when you're talking with a, uh, of course, I use a desk microphone here, like, you know, this on, on the rig I use on ICOM, I got, that's considered phone, uh, a digital, uh, I believe I was talking to Philip uh, there earlier, but digital, uh, I'll hook, I got my computer interface to my rig, and I use software, and there's a bunch of different softwares out there to do this, but I can sit there and talk, I can send uh, I can send a picture, I can send a file, I can receive it, I can sit there and talk uh, all over your radio waves. So, I mean, that's just another mode, you know, ready, PSK, there's a bunch of uh, new ones people come up with. And those don't take as much uh, as wattage, like, you know, 1500 watts if you're doing a phone, depending on the uh, frequency, what time of day, yeah, you need that. But uh, some of the CW, you don't need as much uh, power. It's often done at, uh, you know, two watts, three watts, five watts, 10 watts. Same way as some of these uh, ready PSK and other modes. Uh, it don't take as much for that type of mode uh, to get through the atmospheres, you know, E layer, F layer, et cetera. Uh, that's a whole nother thing to get into. I was trying to keep this a little bit short. Anyway, bunch of different modes. Uh, um, slow scan video, like we're doing a video out right here. I can actually broadcast uh, there's a certain frequency range on each band, but anyway, I can broadcast a slow scan video or I can watch someone doing it. So there's lots of different modes and a lot of fun ways to, to transmit and receive and communicate with other hands. Uh, let me see here. Do you have to learn Morse code? No, they dropped this requirement several years ago and that used to be a, a stumbling block. Uh, to people, you know, learning that Morse code because you had to do so many words per minute. That was a minimum. Uh, so, no, you don't, you don't have to have Morse code to do that. We're going to get more information. Lord, the uh, best ways to learn about it is uh, uh, online. I got it posted here. Uh, ARL has got 800 number down, 1-800-32 uh, uh, New Ham. But anyway, online, uh, qrz.com, that's qrz.com. That's a great place to, to where the tests are. There's several places out there. 
But if you study your technicians, uh, once you, you can make an account with that, you don't need uh, you don't need to have a cost on. You can make your account without it. So once you make your account, you can actually go in and under resources and start practicing your uh, technician test. So there's three tests: technician, general, and uh, your uh, uh, advanced. Mine went blank on me there. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, your technician test gives you privileges on two meters and 440, and you get some uh, HF. I'm trying to think. It's around uh, on 10 meters is all. I think it's 10. I just want to see 20, 28.300 up to 28.500. I think. Anyway, you can learn more about that when you study. But um, that's a great place. You've got some HF uh, privileges. Uh, two meter 440 is cheap to get in, like I say, and you can get a little one of these little bow things. Uh, you know, $35 shipped to you where you can start getting on there that way. Uh, but QRZ, they have a um, excellent place of resources there. You can practice them tests. I think I'd have to look. It's like technician tests, like a pool of 400, 450 questions. So you're actually just sitting there studying. And it shows you, you know, true or false each one. And, and, and where you're weak at, you can go back and look and just study only the areas that you need. And that's just one small resource. There's plenty of places you can get books. YouTube's got free uh, courses if you want to watch videos or both. But I recommend if you're doing those tests, once you start making about 70 to 75 consistent, like three or four days in a row, you can pass the test. At that time, you can you can start looking around who's, who's giving tests. There's some in Bristol, uh, some over in, I'm not familiar with Kentucky exactly, uh who's doing what over there but anyway and here in virginia and why is in this area like i say we get together and we try to set up testing sessions for people with the covid we haven't done nothing since uh, our last testing session was in um gosh right before all this covid in march i think or something or so but i think we're trying to, to get back where we can set up to help people like that but anyway um aarl is a good place to start uh, that number is a good place to start arrl.com is their website there's a lot of good information. Uh, a lot of a lot of people to help teach you and, and give you advice, but it's not that hard to sit there and study for that test. And once you you know start making 70, 75, you find your place and take it, and then you get your license. Usually, um, most people usually do one at a time. I have seen guys come in and take their technician, and then turn around and take their HF and pass them. Uh, I have seen it's been a while, but I have seen a, a gentleman come in one time and he studied for a while and he took his technician and his uh, general and his extra. I'm sorry, did I say advanced? That that was used to be another, uh, they dropped that advanced. It's just the uh, technician, uh, the general, and extra. I'm sorry, extra, yeah, those three. But anyway, I've seen him took all three of them one time and passed it. So uh, a lot of fun things to do with ham radio. Um, it's, if you're like me, when I was looking to get into it, uh, it took me a while before I bumped into somebody that there was a club over in Russell County, Virginia, and put me in contact with them. And then from there, it was a lot easier for me. But like I say, call that number, go to ARL website. Um, if you want anything about it, go to uh, YouTube. Everybody likes YouTube, start punching in ham radio. You'll start seeing guys, operators, this and that and other to give you an idea if you're interested or not. So I think once you get into it, it's like anything else. It's not something that you're probably gonna be doing like 24 hours a day or every evening or something other. But after you get started, get set up, it's just something you can do once in a while at the very least. So yeah, uh, this last screen, that's qrz.com where I posted that. And like I was telling you about uh, YouTube, really good places to study and watch and learn about, you know, different things of ham radio, building antennas. A lot of guys got excellent videos about, you can build your own antenna. When you get an HF rig, you know, buy no antenna, a little bit of wire, a little bit of math. A little bit of uh, soldering, hooking a few things up, and you're in there. So, you know, a basic dipole, you could build, and I believe anybody could watch one of these videos. Anybody could build one probably in two to three hours. So it's not that hard. Of course, plenty of places to buy stuff, very affordable, different wire antennas, all kinds of different. I don't want to go off and get into too much of, of that end of it because you can learn a lot, a lot by watching YouTube, different, you know, Google and stuff like that. But anyway, that's about, you know, that's about, about it from my presentation. You know, uh, like, like I believe I mentioned, $15 for a test. Um, one of them little bow things you can, <laughs> pretty cheap to get into. Um, uh, last little thing, I had a few thoughts, where to get equipment, like qrz.com. Uh, you can get used equipment there. Besides that, you can start Googling uh, Yezu, Icom, ham radio equipment, bunch of different big places uh, to get your equipment. Um, 
some things you may want to have ham radio for. Uh, you might want to have your emergency backup, just like we was talking earlier. Um, have your little two meter rig. You can do uh, point to point simplex type deal. Uh, if you have HF in your car set up, then if the communication is down, you can still you know talk pretty much wherever you want, depending on what your antenna is. Um, and in your closer ranges, I believe I mentioned you mentioned uh, two meters and four four. That's going to be around town here, very 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 close. And then you know local coverage, US and HF. You got around a lot of antennas. Depending on how you set this and up, I mean, you got 1,500, 2,000 miles, easy, easy, just um, around, around the U.S. I've talked to, I don't know, I've worked to Israel, Russia, South Africa, all around the world on 100 watts and, and a wire even. So that's, that's just a general setup. I just wanted to you know, hopefully hit some points. And I can take some questions now. Let me hit my stop share. I'll take some uh, questions if anyone's interested. Hey Grant, a question I had, and this is uh, this is kind of what I had in mind as as one practical use, and uh, you can tell me if it would work or if it wouldn't work. But I, I kind of thought about if I could get my tech license with as many people in my household would do the same. That you know, my sons are always they're they're deer hunting somewhere, and you can't reach them my cell phone, or they're out at the lake somewhere. Uh, just uh, if nothing else, just a, a household communication tool that we can. Uh, communicate with when when cell phones just don't don't work is that a practical uh, application for that uh, that kind of thing or it is it is like i say if they study and make at least their technician license you know a lot of repeaters i bet i could go out my vehicle out there on a repeater and i can hit repeaters gosh oh over in uh, kentucky uh over in tennessee i mean just sitting in my driveway so there's really good coverage that that's available to you where you live at and you know out in the woods wherever uh the little HTs, you can also get you some little, little bit better antenna to throw up in a tree real quick and just unplug like that. The, the longer antenna you have, mm -hmm. unplug it and plug one a little bit better one up in the tree and 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 get even more of a better chance of uh, capturing the signal mm -hmm. or getting out. Especially if you know for whatever reason may not be no cell signal out there or whatever. All right. Okay. Thank you. Hey, Grant, uh, minimum to get started, uh, to put you on the spot, what do you, what, what would you recommend? Uh, you know, not necessarily brands or whatever, but, uh, even if it comes down to brands, what do you, what would you recommend, uh, for somebody, you know, I think all of us on here, other than you probably doesn't have the license, but we, we have an interest. Uh, what do you recommend on, on getting it started? Well, i tell you what, like I was trying to say earlier, there's price ranges, you know, cheaper, more expensive. I would recommend really to uh, get you a little two meter handheld HT, one of them little bow things to get started and get in, get into your technician's class. From there, if you really like and enjoy talking on two meters and the folks that's on the repeaters there, you may want to upgrade to a little bit more of a mobile type unit uh, that's going to have more output power. Those, those, these little rigs, you can get them from three watts, five watts, eight watts, or something like that on the little HTs. But, you know, if you really enjoy two meters and you like a lot, maybe upgrade and you can get these little TYT jobs for 150 bucks, little mobile rigs, but they'll put up like 75 watts, you know, a lot more output power for you. Uh, that's just for two meters getting you started out. HF, I would try to find me a used piece of equipment. Now, if, if, you, if you really go study and you say, hey, I like this. I'm, I'm, I've got my technician license. I'm going to like HF. And high frequency is just, uh, it's more of a broad, like I say, the antennas you use there, you're going to start communicating around the U.S., around the world. Uh, if, if you have the money, the ICOM 7300, if you like ICOM, you can get that with a rebate now for around $1,100. Phenomenal rig, phenomenal price. The Yaesu FTDX 1200, about the same price range, $1,200, $1,300, if you want to go with a brand new rig. But you can go... Uh, on qrz.com and um, you, you can search around there's a couple of other places uh, and you can buy used equipment I mean you might get you a little older like a, an ICOM 735 basic HF rig you may pick it up 400 bucks 300 bucks and, and at least if you're not sure what you want and that will get you enough your foot in the door enough to where you start saying yeah I want to do this well I want to do digital well instead of me interfacing this box to my rig maybe I want the a newer one that already that the USB cable plugs into my computer and you know it's you're gonna to have to try a few things but for not a whole lot of money you can still get in it pretty reasonable thank you uh, 
on, on getting started, let's let's back up. What what do you recommend? The first thing, if we have an interest in it right now, if you you know you're you're talking to you're talking to ten or twelve people right now. Uh, if we have an interest in it, what's the first thing that we need to do to go down this path uh, to get our license? Go to qrz.com and study that technician's class test. And, and there's a lot more uh, resources available, but I use that one a lot, and a lot of people seem to find it very helpful. Go sign up, sign up an account at qrz.com, then go into your resources tab, and then you'll see that technician test and study that and study it. You know, because without getting a license, you won't need any equipment if you don't have a license. So, so basically what we need to do is, uh, is go ahead and, and sign up, start studying. I presume is, is the material free? Is there a charge? It is. The There's no charge. It's free at qrz.com. And they, it has every, it, they keep that updated with the latest question pool. So, and I believe that last one was good too. I forget. I have to look. But anyway, yeah, it's always updated. So if you're studying that technician test there, it's going to be what you're, you're studying for what's going to be on your test. And it's, uh, it is free to you. There's no charge for it at all. Okay. And then I guess the next thing we need to do is find somebody who is, a, who will administer the test. Absolutely. Uh, does that have to be some sort of thing that's, uh, that's scheduled uh or or is it something that uh you pick the phone up and you if you know somebody who is a an administrator can they give it to you how's that work okay yeah there's a liaison uh, angie's one that i know i work with here she lives in clintwood but um she will actually contact like ARRL. That's the people who we give this test through. And she'll contact them and say, I'm going to have this test here. Here's the date and time. And everything. So what we'll do is let's say, example, you uh, and a, a friend or two wants to have a test, contact me. Uh, and I'll try to give everybody my email here. Contact me and uh, I'll contact her and we'll try to get a test session set up for a month or two. And then we'll, wherever the close, we'll try to make sure uh, the closest place for everybody can come. You know, we, we test in libraries. Uh, uh, we gave a test in, uh, in a little steak place there in Norton. <laughs> one day was in the back. No one was back there. They let us go back there and, and, and administer a test. So, yeah, we'll try our best to help uh, to come come to you or set up something that's good for everybody to help get you tested. Grant, I, I assume there wouldn't be any problem with state lines. Like if we had, because uh, nope. we've got people here from, from uh, both, both states, if we want to do one, say, in Whitesburg, uh, that would cover all of us. So. Uh, it would that would cover it. it's not a problem so as soon as uh, she sets that test time and date in the in the location and she handles she's the liaison she handles setting all that up uh, but it, it helps to know where everybody lives at you know if we got two or three or four people so we'll try to pick somewhere that's good for everybody so no one person won't have to travel really really far and, and i think you answered this question i had you said uh, i was going to ask if there's a minimum age but you said uh, just, just as long as somebody's able to take that technician test, they're they're good. If you can take it and pass it, you're good to go. Good deal. And, and also, uh, let's see what did, you said. There was 15 bucks for the license, and yep. it's updated. Did I read somewhere every four or five years you have to update that? Ten years. Your license is good. To Ten years. Okay. And it's a uh, here's a probably a question I should cover. Uh, that I, I didn't even think about when I was taking. Anyway, if you take a test today, this evening, and you pass it, you're not going to get a call sign or nothing. It takes the FCC. Usually, we mail them out the, like, as quick as we can. If it's on a weekend, which we give a lot of tests on weekend, it's Monday. But usually, it's a couple weeks. But once you go into the FCC, and you just go, you can type in ham radio or amateur radio FCC. Once you go to the find that website, as soon as your name shows up in that database, you know Grant Fullen, Wise, Virginia and they'll give you a call sign, you're good to go at that point. Then you can actually get on there. Now, I have, I have, a, I have an interesting question here, uh, you know, call signs. I presume that they just, they give those out, but, you know, uh, Virginia, I know, seems to be the home of vanity plates. And uh, can you pick a call sign if it's available? Okay, first – when you get a technician's class, you'll be assigned the next available call sign. I'll give you an example. I was licensed in 2014. Mine was Kilo Mike 4, Bravo, Oscar, Bravo. Everybody thought my name was Robert. They thought, Bob, B-O-B, Bob. They thought, and I kept that about a year. So then, yeah, I just went and uh, I seen some uh, available. Uh, mine's a one by two, which is November, um, excuse me, two by one. November Foxtrot, that's two. And then the by 
the one is your designated uh, or anyway if it's a vanity it don't matter because one is up in um, where am I looking at? Uh, one's up in uh, yeah, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, up in Connecticut. <laughs> so, but yeah, I applied and got a vanity call sign. And you mentioned something there uh, that's interesting. I did, I have learned uh, as well within the last year that there are different regions and uh, the regions have different numbers. Uh, and you Absolutely. mentioned the one being up in the Northeast. Uh, before uh, before vanity uh, calls like that, actually, when someone for ham gave you his call and his was an eight, let's see, or a seven, yeah, let me look, yeah, six, six is in California. So if I would have gave example, November Foxtrot six, Juliet, you would have known I was in California. But now they have vanity calls, so see, mine's from up in uh, New Hampshire and Massachusetts, so you can't really tell that anymore just for that. Uh, and you had a question in the chat box. Bequita want to know if it costs more to get a vanity. It does. It, okay. it, it's just a little bit more expensive, um, and, and it's not very much. Um, wait a minute. It might not be. I'd have to check on that for you guys. It may be the same price, but you have to pay it again. You have to pay that $15 again. Okay. It's been a while since I've got mine, but that is a good question. I'll try to I'll try to check into that, but I'm pretty sure you just have to pay fifteen dollars. Uh, you apply for it. There's a process you go through. You can do it online or fill out paperwork. Anyway, but once it's approved, uh, you pay for it and you get uh, and you get your vanity stuff. Call sign. Grant, uh, another question, I guess, or comment question uh, that kind of comes back to what we what we've worked on, which is uh, basic preparation over the last three weeks with these. Uh, uh, with these Zoom sessions, um, I know a few years ago there was one of the islands in the in the Atlantic uh, that got hit hard by hurricane, literally lost all power whatsoever, and the only thing left in communication wise was was the ham radio operators, and they were able to communicate. And I, I know a um, Red Cross uh, employee was a actually told me that that was the only communication on the island and to the island and off the island. And uh, how important is at this day and time, I know we're, we're dealing with a lot of social media and I mentioned earlier that it was the original social media. How important uh, here in 2020, uh, even with all that's going on, how important is ham radio? I, I think it's more important than ever. And like you're talking about, that's been a couple, it's the one I'm thinking about a couple of years ago. I forget which one. I was actually doing a relay. I volunteered my time a little bit on uh, 20 meters a couple of weekends because different antennas, different areas, different elevations, you can get out and receive. I don't want to get into the whole thing here, but I, I was accepting relays for people that was trying to do contacts. In other words, I might be able to hear them and I could talk to, let's say, net control and net control couldn't hear them. I would relay their 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 message for them like that. And, and there's a lot of volunteers that do that but it don't matter if it's on islands or here in the u.s or wherever i mean when you know when comms go down communication goes down i mean that, that's a problem and, and just being able to get up and and have people in place uh to, oh wait a minute we can talk here oh we can talk to the next county oh wait we can talk where oh we've talked to tennessee and Virginia. Well, wait a minute we can get this figured out <laughs> it, it, it's really important i mean i know we got computers and there's the internet and, and cell phone tower and stuff. But if you ever have like, let's, you know, a hurricane come through somewhere, even, you know, here, wherever, I mean, it's going to take down stuff for a while. And I think it's more important than ever. I'd like to see everybody be able to make their license, get on and, and play and learn and be able to communicate. Good deal. Any, any other questions for Grant? And Grant, you said you, you might be able to share your, your email, if you, if you didn't mind doing Yeah, that. it's just my, my name at yahoo.com, G-R-A-N-T-F-U-L-E-N. -E I'm on top of the chat at yahoo.com. Okay. And y'all can contact me with any questions anytime. I'll get back uh, as soon as possible to you. Especially if you've been testing or something or other, uh, give me a heads up if you if you've been testing for a while because you like I say we have to uh, she has to file that with the uh, ARRL uh, mm -hmm. like a month ahead of time so we can uh, okay. if you study and you say I think I'm gonna be ready here next two three weeks we'll try to go ahead and and, and get a, a test session 
Oh, I was going to tell you, ARL, their website, there's actually a little, I forget where it's at, a menu, and you can actually go and look for uh, testing sessions around you, put your zip code in and stuff. Okay. That's an excellent, that website is an excellent resource of different things like that. Oh, uh, Hamfest, um, uh, that's just, uh, it's like, it's, it's something for hams. You'll have, a, uh, if you got used equipment, you want to buy, sell, or trade. And there's a lot of vendors that set up all the ICOM, yeah, all these and MFJ, all this ham radio stuff. They'll set up there with booths with the latest, newest stuff. I mean, uh, there's some pretty popular ones. We ain't had none in a while, but some, uh, Joe was telling me the other day that they, uh, Pigeon Forge this weekend, they're actually going to have that one in Tennessee. I forget the name of that club over there. So they're going to let them get together in Tennessee over there. Okay. But that's what a ham fest is. If you hear anybody, oh, I'm going to a ham fest. What's the ham? It's like a big flea market and a big store for uh, for all things ham radio related. <laughs> uh, oh, I bet I can, yeah, I can imagine all the equipment that probably shows up at those. One of the old things a lot of the older hams tell you, they'll say, do you know what ham radio stands for? What ham stands for? And you say, what? And they'll say, home always on mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> Like I told you, you can get cheaper equipment, or I mean, you can get tens of thousands of dollars in antennas and and gear. I mean, there's all kinds of you know. It's just kind of what you want to do with it and what you want to put into it. Yeah. Well, I know Woody commented that uh, I'm. I don't know if you can see the chat box. He commented that he's going to start studying. And uh, Dustin said, "Thank you for the information. Very oh, that's useful." Great. Yeah, guys. Anytime. I enjoyed the session. Thanks so much for the information. And and I'm going to go to that QRZ site and see what see what I can do. I, I'm this has kind of renewed my interest in in getting a license. Here you go. I'll pop, put it in the chat room in case anyone's might need it there. Yeah, it's a, I mean, there's there's several sites out there and a lot of resources, but that's a real good one. And you can sign up for free. You don't need to call. You can omit the call right now, and then you can start studying those exams. And there's a lot of forums on there. If you got any questions, you'll see a general area. So just go right on there and start talking to people. And you'll find most ham operators, they're really good folks. A lot of them, they'll help you any way they can. Yeah. Well, Grant, thank you very much. I appreciate in, it. Anytime. Uh, Y'all guys, been, been very helpful. you can email me. I'll, I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Thanks, Grant. We really appreciate it. Awesome stuff. I'm like Phil. Uh, you've uh, you've renewed my interest as well. So a little bit uh, of studying and, and fifteen dollars, uh, and you got the I, first step out of the way. I need to just break down and fulfill the fulfill the interest. <laughs> if you do study, guys, if you do make your technicians, I would recommend just keep studying, get that general. Once you make that one, go ahead and get that extra. Now the extra is a little. Uh, it's a little more technical, a little more involved. You'll have stuff with uh, sample circuits. That's uh, the extra. And what those give you guys, like your tech, I better explain that real quick. Uh, the reason why there's different uh, classes you get, uh, technician, it gives you like two meter and 440. I told you a little bit on HF. That's a little bit, that's all your privileges there. Now, if you want to start opening up and get on uh, 20 meters, 40 meters, 80 meters, 160 meters, et cetera, you want to make your HF. That's that second test. Once you get that, you get a whole other set of frequencies and places you can go and operate most. Now, finally, there's an advance, and that's like from one edge of our available frequencies to other in each band, you've got full access. Uh, so it's like anything else. In order to get that full access and, and all the privileges, uh, it's a little bit harder to test. And it covers more, you know, you'll have a, what's an op amp? Operational amplifier, you know, uh, what's a MOSFET, metal oxide semiconductor, you know, <laughs> field effect transistor. It's a little more, but it's just studying, guys. It is just studying. You study for like anything else and you can pass it. Really, you can. Anybody, I think, that puts their mind to it can do it. All right. Appreciate that. Right. Jeremy, you have any, any closing comments? I don't, uh, unless you just want to cover Thursday. Uh, Thursday wraps up our, uh, our preparation segment of uh, the 6-1, so. Uh, well, well, Thursday will be, I'm, I'm going to be covering uh, alternative and long-term water solutions. We'll talk just briefly about spring cisterns and then uh, do a little bit on wells and managing those wells and keeping your water supply safe. So that's what we'll be talking about on Thursday. All right, so, uh, so again, thanks to, to Grant. Thanks to everybody who logged in tonight.
and uh, hopefully we'll see you all on Thursday. Good to see everybody. You too. Everybody have a good evening. Okay, y'all too. How, however, if anybody needs anything. You do the same. Okay, thank you.